Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 532. That's 532 of the Agostino Zynga Show. Hope you're doing well wherever you may be. If it's the first time check out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, please give me a five-star review. And if you want to subscribe via the Patreon, please do. I've got bonus episodes going on there all the time. Bonus episodes up there at the end of the week. So for $1 or the equivalent of £1 per month, you get access to all my bonus episodes as well as all the other bonus bits of content on there as well. And I, like I said, I upload a bonus content piece every end of the week, as well as a bonus stream coming into the week for only my Patreon subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed on there already, please do join the gang. There's not many of us on there, but still it's Patreon content. It's behind the paywall. It's more X-rated type of stuff. So if you want to get involved in that, please do. I really welcome your interaction over there. But yeah, man, how's it going? I hope you guys are well. I hope you guys had a good Christmas. Um, I had a fairly eventful one, as per usual. Most people do when it comes to family and stuff. But hey, it is what it is. It was nice to see everybody together. It was nice to kind of conversate, catch up, share stories and whatnot and gifts and all that malarkey. You know how it is. But um, yeah, man, what an interesting holiday, isn't it? Christmas is one of these only seasons or holidays that we have in the year where you're kind of forced to be around your family and you're forced to confront some things that you probably didn't want to confront or some things that you've been put into the wayside or some things that you've been put into the back of your mind. And for whatever reason, Christmas forces that upon you. And again, it shouldn't really be that, right? Um, you know, the the actual day, is actually, especially from its religious origins, isn't actually a time for you to kind of get around the table and start shouting at each other. But for whatever reason, it ends up doing that. And especially now in this highly politicized, you know world that we live in at the moment where it seems like everybody has some sort of strong opinion on politics either way um it kind of just makes for an absolute you know uh pot of absolute boiling stew or people just throwing in their opinions things flying out or, or maybe a or maybe a really hot frying pan i'm not too sure but whatever it is it's never a fun time let's just say that it's never the funnest time of all time but you know we get through it we get through it um now obviously looking forward to the new year I know some people, the type of type payment people who are obsessed with work are kind of struggling now because the time between Christmas and New Year's is a bit weird, especially now because it's kind of fallen on like a Monday and then New Year's is basically like on the end of the week. So essentially, if you want to work and you want to get things done, you've basically been out of action for two weeks because people, no, or maybe three weeks. People take maybe take the week before Christmas off. Then the week of, you're obviously traveling and doing your thing. Then the other week is obviously following, that is New Year. So effectively, you might have been out of work or out of communication with people for two and a half, maybe three weeks, which is absolutely insane, especially if you're freelancing and kind of doing your own thing. So I could definitely appreciate people who are a bit pissed off with all that stuff. But, you know, it's slowly and surely getting back to normal. Once the New Year starts again, we'll be back into the regular swing of things, you know, countries all over the world are you know um, putting together restrictions and whatnot um to limit people's communication or interaction with other human beings to limit obviously the spread of omicron virus or the omicron variant so by the new year anyway people won't necessarily have any distractions so if you are a bit annoyed that people aren't answering your emails and you're not getting back the responses in a prompt time that you'd want them relax because you know in a couple of weeks you're probably going to have everybody you know replying to you in the minute because you know they can and because they've got nowhere else to go because these restrictions are absolutely nuts but again i'm I'm thankful i'm not complaining because i booked some holiday between new years and i think towards the middle of mid of new year so i think i might have booked holiday for like the first like the sixth or something of january and again i'm not going to go anywhere it's kind of a staycation but the idea was to go out somewhere go out and party a bit not on new year's eve because that's a bit played out i'm probably going to end up going for a little meal on new year's eve to kind of celebrate that and bring in a new year that way maybe go for some steak chill out have a bottle of wine um you know maybe some maybe a cheeky bubbly or two and then chill out like that but going forward man going forward like i'm so thankful that england has to be the only place um, in the uk where you can go and party during new year's eve i don't know how we managed it i don't know how we blagged it considering the numbers considering all the miscommunication not miscommunication considering all the conflicting information coming out from scientists on either side the ones that are pro lockdown the ones that are obviously anti-lockdown it seems like we should be in a situation where we should be mirroring the other home nations like wales scotland and whatnot in ireland we shouldn't really be in a place where we're kind of opening things up but here we we are it is what it is so for whatever reason the uk happens to be one of the only places that's going to have clubs open in new year's eve 
I pray for all my fellow um, nightlife um, <laughs> people that work in that industry, whether you're DJing, whether you're working behind a bar, whether you're security, whether you're a bar back, whether you're a, you know, what's, what's a sous chef, whether you're just a kind of picker, what's that thing called? Chip, chip and pick, whatever the thing called, called the thing. When you cut stuff, whatever, whatever, whatever denomination you work in in the nightlife and hospitality, I am praying for you because I have a feeling it's going to be one of the most sloppiest, messiest, um, dramatic, um new year's eve we've had in a while because everyone's pent up sort of rage and people's desire to go out and party especially considering that most likely we're going to have restrictions i'm assuming sometime in the new year there was that conversation around um it supposedly being enacted after is it after christmas the whole idea behind it was that they were going to put in restrictions between this basically the start of this week so 27th onwards because that then would then allow them to let us have christmas quote unquote like a present and obviously lock down to new year but now confirmations come out that we're going to be fine for the new year so that's going to be okay but jesus man it's not looking good for everybody else um and again like i said because we're in place it's going to be open i'm just assuming it's going to be absolutely nuts people are going to be going absolutely crazy on the streets but again fingers crossed it doesn't happen fingers crossed it doesn't happen but anyway, we've got a lot of topics to talk about, many things to jump on into. So if you're chilling at home and you're relaxing or whatnot, grab yourself a drink, grab yourself a little bite to eat and let's jump on in. I've been giving some feedback actually on the podcast. I shouldn't be slurping my teas and whatnot when I'm doing this podcast. So again, forgive you. I f please forgive me if you're sensitive when it comes to, you know, audio noises and whatnot. Um, for the slurping I've been doing with cups of massive cups of coffee and tea I've been having on the podcast that will that will I'll be I'll be refraining from doing so and if I am going to drink it I'm going to mute my mic especially because I've got a second screen now and then you're not going to be able to hear it but yeah if you are concerned about the slurping don't be I'm not going to slurp I promise I'm not going to slurp so here we go first things first talking about how crazy it is to be you know back with your family during the christmas holidays and how how kind of not dramatic or how how chaotic it can get in a very short space of time all it takes is a couple of topics that are a little bit racy or a little bit controversial or are in the public consciousness or are in part of culture at the moment and then suddenly everybody just erupts into a cacophony of just outrage and you know finger pointing and maybe some indirect insults you know how it is right but you never probably go as far as thinking oh you know what this day is the day i'm gonna go and shoot my parents right you never really think about that i'm gonna shoot my family members or extended family but for whatever reason this guy in new york thought that that he, he he definitely thought like that and he did it so this is courtesy of the new york post it says the following a son who shot parents um in their li mansion on christmas is a new york city bodybuilder cops report so this dude here um as he's pictured called uh dino tomasetti for whatever reason got in some sort of hot and bother argument with his parents that he decided to shoot them and from what we can gather it looks like he might be the only child so that was makes it even more insane because usually i found the more the more kind of um tense the atmosphere is usually kind of yeah the tense i found usually especially when it comes to christmas holidays the only times I've seen arguments and fights has usually been when all of my family are there, my extended family, so my brothers and my parents, and then when extended family members are there, uncles, aunties, cousins, and nieces and nephews and whatnot, right? Because it's just more people. There's going to be varying amounts of, you know, points of views, and they're just going to go for it from the minute one. But if you're a single, if, you, if, you, if you're the only child, right, and your parents are pretty chill, especially, I'd imagine, I don't know, parents that live in that sort of neighborhood are maybe quite chill you might be you might share the same sort of political views and whatnot especially considering the way he looks you wouldn't imagine he's the most liberal guy if his parents are conservative or whatnot what would there be points to you to get really angry about right maybe apart from your allowance or maybe them bugging you that you haven't got a kid or they haven't got a family or you're not married i can't really see any other points where it would be such an issue that they'd want to you want to get to a point where you'd want to kind of shoot them in the head unless they just completely didn't agree with your lifestyle maybe they didn't like the fact that he was a bodybuilder and he might or he might have or did not take roids i don't know but it just seems weird that a single parent a kid that's from an only a kid that's a kid that's the only kid in a family right would also be the one that would also go that far to like shoot his parents because you'd imagine you'd be closer to one of them so you'd have a maybe it's a maternal closeness with your mum or it's a dad closest because you know you want to kind of emulate him in the family business or you want to emulate him in life but i would never assume that there'd be that much tension within a one child household that he would come to a point where he'd want to blam both of the parents like it's mad it's absolutely mad 
says the following it says um the man who allegedly shot his parents um at their long island mansion christmas morning was identified sunday as 29 year old bodybuilder from brooklyn according to cops in a report the pumped up dino tomasi to sorry thomas said he is accused of shooting his 65 year old father in the back and 65 year old 64 year old mother in the head at their uh, tony hewlett harbor home at about 10 a.m on saturday um according to the nasu county cops the home looks absolutely amazing too of course it's a mcmansion but still it's a beautiful home they probably they've got two garage two driveways there two sorry two garages connected um probably got 10 plus bedrooms maybe five right he probably has his own little wing his own little corner where he could basically you know sneak in girls if he wants to or lads wherever where he swings it's probably an easy life especially if he's 29 living at home you'd imagine he doesn't really want for much right he just kind of you know does what he needs to do maybe he's he's got like a direct line to his father's business or his mother's business whatever it may be but what would really drive a guy in that position to want to shoot his parents and again shooting your shooting your dad in the back that's some pussy shit in it like if you've got an issue with your father you're gonna shoot him in the face you gotta shoot him front f forward and then shoot your mom in the head that's also a madness i'm just thinking in my head like we've all come to i think we've all got to a point with our parents especially if you're older where you've kind of especially yeah especially when you get older you start to realize you start to look at your parents and your family members mostly as adults and less so as that authoritative figure that tells you what to do when you can go out what you can eat who you can talk to on the phone right they're mostly just adults and you just realize okay what one at one point in life you're also a child and you also made mistakes and you're also fallible not everything that you do is right not everything you do is perfect not everything you say is correct or whatever it may be um and you start to maybe not take a you know maybe you start to maybe disregard what they have to say you maybe start to be a little bit dismissive of their points of view you maybe just decide to kind of run away and go do your own thing but you don't necessarily get to the point i don't think in that position where you'd want to you know um enact violence to that point maybe you might want to get in a tussle with them right there's always that point people say where um in every man's life you get to a point where you want to just wrestle your dad to kind of prove that you're the man in the house which i don't really agree with. i don't think that happens all the time because especially not african households you do that in african household you might end up dead you know you might end up that meme you know that meme people do where you're, you're you're doing like some martial arts and then bam you suddenly wake up and you're in heaven that might be you if you try and scrap with an African parent. It's not going to end well for you. Especially, I'd imagine the same thing goes for like, you know, um, Hispanic parents, Asian parents. They don't play that game at all. They don't play this, oh, let me test myself again, my dad. You're going to get cut off completely. The whole family is going to excommunicate you. Even if you win, it's not going to be good for you. So I don't think that's the case, but yeah you might want to get angry yeah you might want to slam a door you might want to say shut up or something but to get to the point where you want to shoot clap your parents especially what well, so where's the gun was it does he have it on him all the time does he have to get it from a cabinet like and then he's pulling it cocking it back while his parents are screaming and still blaming them off the the mad thing is that they're both still alive i don't know why that is maybe he, he's he got one of those kind of pew pew um james bond's gun that they put in a sock or something or maybe he just shot them in a place where because I, I the gun thing i don't get because i like, maybe because i don't live in america but i don't understand how people just don't die instantly from getting gun from getting a gunshot um to the head or to the back like you just imagine all the organs around there especially the brain and stuff how are you still alive when you get shot like that it doesn't make any sense to me but you know hopefully they make a speedy recovery <coughs> But still, like I mentioned, I just don't get it, man. People that live in a lap of luxury like this, especially as I'm saying, like, I'm just thinking to myself now. Usually, again, maybe I'm 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 in the minority here and I'm just speaking out of turn, but from the way that I've grown up, right, in a fairly poor household, um, in a very rough neighborhood, I grew up with people that, you know, did some very questionable things in their life and just generally a chaotic environment. Those are usually the places where you think you might build up a little bit of resentment from your parents or no, towards your parents, towards your circumstances that would make you want to act out to, with your friends in school, at church, whatever, right? But you would imagine if you grew up in a lap of luxury, I don't think you want to act out in this way, not in a violent way. Maybe act out in terms of tapping into drugs or losing yourself in nightlife or relationships and stuff, right? I can understand that emotionally you might not be as connected as you, as you need to be with your parents because in order for them to make that money, they have to work crazy amounts of hours or they may have to be just distant in general, right? Or they're just brought up a different way. But you wouldn't imagine it would drive you to the point of that kind of violence, like, you know, elimination violence. That's what shooting is. Like I said, if it was a stabbing, 
that's also very personal but shooting is elimination that's why i think of it i don't think of shooting just like oh you're doing play play this isn't like i'm gonna shoot you in the leg like shoot someone in the leg and it hits an artery and you can still bleed out in it we've, we've seen that plenty of times before this whole thing in movies where you shoot someone in a kneecap and they're all right is not true because they might not be able to walk again um or like you know what happened to boosie where he got shot in the leg and there were talks about them having to maybe amputate his leg do you know what I mean and that's a conversation too that was happening so i just i just can't picture in my head how that again i can understand especially after the christmas that i've had where you go back to your family's home and then you start talking about certain things and then it just explodes because you know people just we're all adults we have our point of view you can agree and disagree you just argue cool i get it and you get to a point where you want to be violent and you want to push somebody or say something aggressive but to get to a point to pull out a blammy yo that is some wild boy stuff wild boy stuff and i'd assume as well this isn't the first time they've gotten some sort of physical altercation i would imagine so you don't just go from arguing with your parents about not being allowed out at night and then suddenly pulling out a gun this definitely is something that's basically been cooking up in the background for a while i'd, I'd imagine so um or the other, only other thing I, th I can think of is roid rage maybe he just woke up one day and just acted out because of the gear he's taking or again like i said it might be something criminal like maybe he's maybe the i don't know maybe the family are tied up in some this like some some things that we don't know about and then he kind of acted out in that regard but just a straight up argument about i don't know whether or not trump lost the election fairly or something or um differing views about the capitol building flipping the um, insurrection i don't know i don't think that would be enough to send somebody to go and clap them i don't think so but hey um both victims identified by law enforcement new jersey office um this uh sorry uh rocco and vincenzo tomasetti had to undergo surgery for their wounds the father said to be more serious condition sources told the violence police is that what i'm saying see what i'm saying about guns don't make sense the guy the dad got shot in the back but he's in more critical he's in a worse condition than the wife is who got shot in the head like <sighs> Mamma mia. Um, property records show that the mansion valued at 3.2 million according to real estate is owned by the couple. Again, if ugh, I, I don't get it. Uh, Dino, a 5'9", 235 pound muscle man fled to New Jersey in a Cadillac Escalade after a shooting police sources confirmed. Um, sorry, police sources told The Voice. 5'9", 230 pounds. Bruv, he's, he must be a fucking unit, innit? He must be a wham. Um, he, he's, um, his fancy vehicle was tracked through GPS by the New York State Police. Uh, absolute shock if you're gonna go shoot your parents you gotta think of a better escape plan than that than jumping in the escalator they bought for you like huh um it would gps in it hmm. um through gps by new york state police who contacted the mawaha police department uh, to help when the suspect reached the area sources says authorities nabbed dino without incident just after 2 p.m sources told the voice he will remain in custody in bergen county charged with as a fugitive from justice pending his extradition to the nassau county the outlet reported his charge in new york will, will ultimately depend on the condition of his parents okay cool so if they recover or not then they have to go from there i wonder if maybe it's a thing for my american friends out there i wonder what happens in a crime like this if he shot both his parents but they both recover and they both don't want to press charges can the new york state still kind of um can they still charge him that can still happen right i'm assuming even if the victims don't say they want to press charges can you still go to court for the crime he did and serve some time i don't know again i'm it's unlikely but you know um i'd imagine mediterranean um you know um america so italian american families especially like this they go through some wild shit it, it wouldn't surprise me if they come out of this uh, again fingers crossed they come out of this okay and they kind of say that they understand they forgive their son or something because it's their only son they don't want to see him rot in prison do you know what I mean i've seen stranger things have happened so i wonder if they um refuse to cooperate and you know they don't want to press charges can the police still go after him let me know in the comments if you know that let me know um, it continues here, it says Dino works as a personal trainer according to Daily Voice. His father owns a Brooklyn based Empire Transit Mix located at the Massive Avenue. That state record show a worker who answered the phone for the company was completely unaware of the boss had been shot bloody hell the voice man snitching already um this is definitely shocking news to me he said dino's mother owns a dance studio stars on broadway in lynbrook a record show a phone call to the studio was not returned a woman outside of dino's building in east williamsburg who identified herself as a best friend told the post that he's definitely not a violent person so again looks like two regular loving long island parents who dote after their only son let him live at home until he's 29 give him his own wing and his own section in the mansion give him an escalator drive right like 
just give him anything that he needs probably pay for the flipping roids that he does and then as a thank you gift on christmas he decides to shoot the dad in the back and then shoot the mom in the head merry christmas isn't it merry fucking christmas it continues i'm nope, nope, oh she said he's my best friend i don't really want to talk about it she added before driving off a work in a building called Tom. i said he's a great guy so again everyone that works at this company um has great things to say about him despite them also being given a chance to say stuff off the record so again that goes to show that he might actually be a decent dude he runs a tight ship but you know fair fair boss um jokes to be around pays you on time lets you get extra shift you know it's understandable if you want to take time off and then he's probably the kind of guy where you kind of see his son coming to work and you can't figure out because that's what happens sometimes sometimes really good parents give birth to really shitty kids and sometimes really good kids are parented by really shitty parents it just is a luck of the draw it's just unfortunate that way so maybe sometimes he comes to work this dino guy and the staff are like how the hell did they give birth to such an entitled piece of you know bloody blah um but it's just one of those unfortunate things isn't it it's just a random thing of life it continued here says um what can you do the worker said i'm from the south bronx shit happens every fucking day man not much i can do about it he did what he had he did what he did what he felt like he needed to do i guess <laughs> it's probably someone from the streets like look people die every day b as cameron would say um, he's a great guy man i wouldn't expect him to do something like that the parents neighbors were shocked that and such incident could happen in their quiet affluent neighborhood of course it's always the ones that you least expect it's never people that look like me actually you absolute donuts but again if i look like them i parked outside someone's home uninvited and call the police on me but the actual person that's murking everybody is the son of one of these guys like you know you couldn't make it up um they're lovely people the quote says here i don't understand the whole thing a resident told the post they're very they're very nice people you couldn't ask for better neighbors that's all i can tell you they don't bother you they keep their house beautiful they talk to you and say can i help you with anything they're very fine people i can't have a bad way to say about them so literally everybody they've spoken to on the record and off the record has reiterated what great people these people these parents were and um how shocked they are the whole incident which doesn't really paint a good light for this guy called dino and it? it's not really looking good for dino um no one's kind of come out and basically said he's a great guy to work out with he spots you amazing in the gym he knows just how to apply the right syringe to your buttocks to give you that little push you need <laughs> this is yeah i feel sorry for them what else can you think of i feel very sorry for them i hope they survive and come out of this Another stunned neighbor who said he was not in their home at the time of the shooting said the um, the seldom saw the married couple out in public and had never seen their son. We saw the husband and the wife rarely. The husband was fixing stuff in the yard and brought packages over and stuff. We are very surprised. We are scared. We feel bad for them. And then I think the final update, which I just saw recently, is that I think he's rejected to be extradited, which I don't really understand. I guess because he he, he drove into another state right when he fled. Um, so uh ways is right for extradition so what well, it says here the bodybuilder subjected to the so suspect of the shooting of his parents at their sprawling long island mansion has waived his right to an extradition hearing in new jersey and will be sent back to new york to face charges okay so i guess if he wanted to escape and be um clever he could escape to new jersey and maybe their laws there are different he get a different sentence i guess but i guess it shows that he's got some level of what's that word called um some level of remorse that he's waived the right and has been sent back to new york to kind of you know face the music over there but yeah man crazy crazy times and again i, I don't know i think we've all been in very contentious arguments and tense arguments with our family members especially our parents especially our extended family but i don't think i've ever got to a point where i wanted to legitimately shoot either of them in the head it's just not something i've ever crossed my mind but if it's ever crossed your mind then let me know in the comments and if you've ever wanted to <laughs> pull out a strap and murk your mum or dad let me know in the comments down below i'd love to hear it no judgment of course made no judgment of course mate um what else do we have here oh this is a interesting article this is courtesy of um ra so of course you know with england being the only place where events are going to happen in terms of new year's eve it's kind of brought about a very interesting problem for people obviously in the other nations other home nations such as wales scotland and republic of ireland um they're in a really tricky position and even the clubs here now especially with the last minute um confirmation that clubs are going to be open it's hard to get things into place it's hard to get acts that you want to play in order to basically make the club make sense in terms of operational cost because imagine if the if the green light got given so late it's really difficult to get somebody in to fly them in to kind of play your event because you know so late notice um obviously to get all the visas done because obviously now we're out of, we're out of flipping the euro and whatnot 
so it's a whole mad mad situation i guess ra put together a pretty decent article talking about the entire thing that i'm going to quickly read through for you right now the headline is we're really in limbo land how a lack of government guidance and support is crippling the club scene ahead of new year's eve um club scenes around the world are struggling with the upheaval caused by the covid19 variant omicron and the subsequent lack of the government guidance in the uk where omicron has caused record highs of covid19 cases a situation varies from country to country while venues are now closed in wales scotland and northern ireland sorry i said probably because of northern ireland they remain open in England as owners and promoters await instructions and again I, I don't know if, it, if this is the case but for for myself anyway just speaking for myself this Omicron variant this Omicron variant or whatever is happening at the moment has been one of the most contagious variants I've ever seen in my life this has been the only time during the entire pandemic this whole two and a half years that we've had under the, under it right where I've this is the one variant that's infected most of my friends and any other before like most of the people that I know people that even don't go out as much as I do who aren't super party heads somebody that I know even through extension has had Omicron or has had COVID within this period again I don't know how you can test for it I don't know if you can see if you've got the variant or not but regardless whatever variant is going on at the moment is highly contagious but the only saving grace about it it's not lethal as before I'm not seeing people going straight to hospital I'm not seeing people having to you know be put on ventilators and shit i'm just seeing everyone kind of getting it you know really quickly you know you know in a short space of time but then also recovering and also i'm not seeing the same symptoms as like losing your sense of smell and sense of taste and shit i've not really seen that i've just seen people saying it's a really aggressive cold like super debilitating where you can't do anything but it's not as bad as maybe but it's not as lethal as maybe the the delta variant that obviously came about last year was it right it continues here it says this state of limbo has extremely damaging implications, says Michael Kill, the head of the nighttime industry. Um, he said that the current open, sorry, this current open closed door policy cannot continue to new year. Um, he says extensions of business rates relief until the end of 2022 and a freeze on bounce back loan repayments and the reintroduction of furlough. By keeping venues open, the government has once again shifted the oneness on the public safety onto the owners. And at the same time, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been advising people to limit their socialising, deterring many viewers, sorry, deterring very viewers from going out this left venues with a difficult decision on whether or not to cancel or postpone events so as per usual with our government they're speaking out both sides of their mouth so they keep the the venues open because they don't want the the kind of pushback and uh um and the outrage from that sector because they're very vocal especially people like sasha lord and shit on social media they kind of rally the troops and they put things in a very clear english in a way to kind of get people to understand what basically your hospitality industry is facing and they don't want that negative press especially off the back of all these pictures that leaked of them celebrating and enjoying themselves you know last year when we were in lockdown and stuff so they don't want any more bad pr so they keep the clubs open but then they also advise the public not to go out and socialize because it's not safe because of this omicron variant which obviously puts which obviously damages the ability of the club to attract people to come to their clubs because like i said beforehand i think the major kind of lasting damage of covid and these lockdowns has been re really has been the kind of um has been the loss of the general punter or you say the normie crowd because i think we underestimated it myself included especially being a, a club goer being a promoter having been a dj i think i underestimated um how important the normie person was to the overall landscape of club land that person that just maybe pops by or that person that maybe goes out once a month maybe once or six months they're actually maybe part of the they're, they're actually more important you might say than actually the club kids because those people are the ones that come about every single year they don't really care about whether or not it's cool to go out or not but they're going to be in soho clubs they're going to be in clubs up north they're going to be maybe going to do their odd bit of techno tourism in europe and they're going to be the ones that are going to be you know willing to spend money at the bar willing to buy merch whatever it may be right they're going to be there consistently there's going to be several there's going to be different variants there there's going to be different versions of the same person going to those places all throughout the year and i think we kind of um took those people for granted because we just focus on you know um talking to the club kid and talking to the people that basically love the music like 24 7 which is obviously understandable but i think covid has basically um pushed those people out they've kind of got scared of it um, they've got scared of going to clubs because they don't want to be in an environment where they might get the virus and they basically i think in general just found new hobbies they found other things to fill their time they're probably not bothered about going to clubs anymore and there's no way we're ever going to get them back and i think that's the lasting damage of it so again tourism is going to be obviously a good thing once the world reopens up again especially parts of europe in terms of allowing people to kind of free flow and back and forth like i, I did when i went to berlin but i think that loss of the normie crowd is something that i don't think what clubland's ever going to recover from and i think that might actually 
be a good thing in general kind of let's say silver lining in that maybe clubs now because that normie crowd doesn't exist there's no need to be so hell bent on making sure you book the 10 biggest djs as listed on fucking dj mag list or something you can actually be a bit more risky because the people going to the club don't necessarily care about the the ones going now aren't necessarily going only because of the names they're going because they want to go out right because you're putting yourself at risk by going out so you're not only going to go and see solomon you want to go because you want to have a dance and it is nice bonus that solomon's playing but it's not the only drive so if that's the case maybe marrying up a solomon with like a nap with like a lineup that's a bit more underground or a little bit less less loan might be a good thing to go with in the future so that might be a good consequence of it but that normie crowd that loss in nightlife is just monumental it continues here it says um london super club print works chose to postpone which is a big deal right they're a big club they only they only stay open until 12 the whole idea when print works opened it opened like in a former print working factory um here in london the whole idea behind it i think it, if i'm not mistaken it opened at the same time that the night tube was reintroduced so the idea was that you could go and party there from like 11 a.m or something up until 12 p.m or 12 a.m and then you could get the first night tube back home if you needed to so you didn't need to kind of you know um, spend money on you know uh, taxis and stuff or ubers or go on a night bus and take hours you can still get to basically most locations in london by taking the central line or get closer to your home that's basically the whole premise around it so if they can't figure out how to stay open again it's only from 11 or sometimes 12 p.m until 12 a.m and they couldn't do it it t it shows you like you know how much damage this whole kind of you know will they won't they sort of thing has, has done to the whole club space it continues, it says here, Richie Horton was scheduled to debut his new From Our Minds project at the venue December 18th. He said, we had a major blow when it was cancelled, he told RA. The most depressing and sad thing was that we let down so many of our younger artists. He's anticipating free NYC cancellations, sorry, free NYC cancellations, meaning fans are disappointed clubbers and lots of wasted hard work. And also, this also goes to speak about why I kind of have some sympathy now with some of these kind of um, uh, plague rave DJ guys, because... I know a lot of us, it's hard to basically put yourself in the shoes of these people because they're multi-millionaires, but that's still a lot of money. Like this, this guy runs a label, he's got a, he's got a project he's doing, he's releasing headphones and shit. Richie Horton and those kind of business techno people, they pay a lot of people's salaries. So if he's not able to play NYE shows, that means people that also take a salary from him being an artist are also going to suffer, right? They're not going to be able to pay their mortgage. They're going to be able to put their kids through school. So it has a knock-on effect. So that's probably why these people like Nina Kravitz and these nastiers and stuff, they take the most like... You know nonsense um bookings in maybe some hot places around the world because it's not just about them right the where they're going to play that funds or those monies or those dj fees are going to feed other people who kind of kind of you knock on effect even if you go to a smaller so even if you go to these quote-unquote third world countries and you go and play when it's really red hot um those promoters actually want you to play there the local industry maybe needs you to play there too because it's a knock-on effect when you go play the person that sells the little flipping pineapples outside in the street might get some extra business the one that does a whatever do you know what I mean? it has a knock-on effect in the economy so it's a far-reaching thing when a dj of that ilk isn't able to play because of governmental restrictions or whatnot do you know what I mean? it kind of has a knock-on effect it says here Pal sorry palestinian dj dj summer um was scheduled to play at printworks alongside horton she told ra that her becoming calculations including the show in glasgow sub club will impact an estimated thirteen thousand ravers and i'm sure most are in the pocket it says here it's just a question of venues and artists can survive the economic hit she said ultimately the only way we can overcome this what's happening is to get everyone vaccinated and make large gatherings as safe as possible but that's a problem though that's never going to happen I just don't think we're going to ever get to a place, especially in the Western world, where you're ever going to get a huge majority of people vaccinated. I just think we don't run like that as a country. We don't run like that as a sector of the world, whatever it may be called, right? Um, that whole idea about, um, what would you call it? What's the term called? That whole idea about um, putting the needs of others in front of yourself doesn't exist in the Western world. It doesn't. Like the whole idea of like the common good it doesn't exist because that's what basically the vaccinations are because there's loads of conflicting information about whether or not they work the way they're intended to work whether or not um it's a one fix it's a one one size fits all fix um the obviously the negative effects some people are having on it there's loads of information out there that kind of doesn't just say okay categorically the vaccine is the only and best option there are other alternatives out there and because of that people are then latching onto them cool and always access to information and with this idea that you are an individual and you know the i don't know individualism maybe is a, is a blame to this but i just don't think we're ever going to get to a point where we're going to get higher than like an 80 
um, percent adoption rate when it comes to vaccination. I just don't think that's possible. I just don't think so. Especially the more time goes on, the more these variants mutate, the more maybe they become contagious but less lethal. People will start naturally asking questions and just be a bit suspicious that we just keep doing the same thing and we keep having the same results. They just don't gonna they're not gonna just quickly jump on a jump on the idea, oh it's just a vaccine that needs to help. They're gonna think maybe it's the other approaches. So if that's the case, we need to figure out a solution that we can do where we can kind of quote unquote live with it like what's the next step like if if we can't get everyone vaccinated how do we make large gatherings possible and safe that's the next step going forward because if we just keep going around this kind of this rigmarole it's going to be the same it's going to be grand whole day again mm-hmm. next year around the winter time we'll have another variant pop up or maybe the summer and then suddenly all the venues will close again because as per usual all governments think whenever the virus spreads again there's always these places that are um that usually have people in densely packed areas that are always the mass spreaders when usually the data doesn't say that the evidence doesn't say that at all but they just always go for the kind of low-hanging fruit in terms of dealing with situation it continues to says techno pioneer Chris Liberator who played at the Boxing Day gig at London Ford had his shows cancelled in France, Germany and Spain. Um, he said that at least other in at least in other countries you know the the score because they're shutting down he said which is true but in the UK this lack of clarity is costing livelihoods when you promote a gig it's not just DJs affected like I said there's also bar staff cleaning security it's like the government's letting clubs fight a losing battle that will disintegrate into bankruptcy you just can't work in that environment it's better to do something to help them than pontificate and it's true and it's actually better to just cancel it or just lock the country down from early doors and to leave them in this weird limbo where they're waiting for an announcement when the announcement comes it's too late and when it does come it comes with a caveat and then people are put off going out it's just nonsense it continues here it says it's uncertain whether a 24-hour event at fold will go ahead we're in a constant state of knowing what's going on or what's so what's going to happen said the general manager Miyu bamboo told ra staff are on standby but we cannot guarantee work not knowing where your next paycheck is coming from is daunting for everyone we need strategic thinking from the government every lease of different scenarios they plan for would be great too so we know what they're prepared for Very Venues like Nottingham's iClub are also making their own informed decisions about opening or closing. The Let There Be House event scheduled on December 27th was cancelled after a sold out event the week before it only drew 50% of ticket holders. That is brutal. That that I was going on the end it, but that is brutal, isn't it? And exp- again, this definitely explains what I've been seeing out there when I've been going out myself. There's definitely a lack of actual people going to these events. A couple of parties I went to, especially the one I went to in Fold, um, they were completely sold out. I had to buy a ticket on the resale app, like Ticket Swap, I think I might have put it on. And when I went to the event, it was nowhere near sold out. There was, there was, you know, there was plenty of room in the club, of course, which is nice because you can dance around and not be too sweaty everywhere. But there's clearly a huge dip in terms of the people that actually attend these events in real life and that's always been an issue anyway when you when you promote a night especially when i used to promote nights and used to mainly have most of your promotion channel be facebook you sometimes get a little bit gas off the numbers of confirmed guests that went to go to your event but after a couple of events you quickly realize that usually if you've got a high number of people attending the event by clicking attending on facebook it usually meant that maybe 20 if not 10 percent of those people would actually go to the event there wasn't a lot of it so it wasn't there was no correlation between the numbers you see online via the numbers that you see in real life and now it's even worse because the people are actually paying for the tickets but they're not turning up and why they're not turning up because they can afford to because now people have a lot more disposable income because they're not maybe doing the things that they did previously when we had a knockdown right in the, in the pre-lockdown world you may be a bit more tight on money so you'd probably just go because you've already paid for the ticket but now if you spent 20 quid 30 quid even 50 quid on a ticket to go to a club and you woke up one day you're like you know what it doesn't feel safe i feel like this omicron variant is a bit too contagious you could just knock it on the head and not go and it wouldn't be that much of a bother no you know what i mean you could just continue going especially if you've got you know a, a decent job or you're earning okay like you, you wouldn't that you wouldn't care too tough so it must be really really scary for clubs now to see that right? proper sold out events where you sold legitimately you know loads of tickets for, uh, beforehand but on the day it doesn't work because again operating operating costs on the night are a lot because when you sell out a show i'm assuming or an event i'm assuming you're gonna maybe uh, you know hire more staff or get more staff in maybe pump up the security so then on the night you end up having a negative because the bar spend isn't great you have to you know overpay in terms of the staff that are there they're obviously not getting that much work the tips are low it just must be so 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 bad to deal with man i can't i can't imagine how difficult it must be to work in hospitality right now in this in this current predicament that we're in it must be so 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 hard so yeah force of things got to everybody involved 
Again, New Year's Eve is going to be interesting. Like I said, I think it's going to be one of the most sloppiest New Year's Eve we've had in a while. I also think it's going to be weirdly quiet because a lot of people that I've spoken to have decided that they're going to do what I'm going to do, which is go somewhere and have a have some nice dinner, um, maybe have a have a glass of wine, welcome in the New Year that way, and then just go home. Do you know what I mean? Many people are doing that. So if that's the case, from the people that I know who are generally a good variety of people from like the party heads to the chill heads, I can only imagine what everyone else is doing in terms of the quote unquote normie world. So it's going to be absolutely peak out there. It's going to be absolutely peak. And yeah, man, like it's just it, it, it just never it just like it feels like one step forward or two steps back in it. It's just when whenever you think it's going to get better, it doesn't. Uh, it's just I don't know. I don't know and this is of course another update here courtesy of the BBC I think like kind of ringing true to what all the club um, people were complaining about and this is courtesy of the BBC up in the screen here it says um, enjoy the new year but be cautious as a care minister again which is pretty much useless information and maybe does more damage than good for the people that work in the hospitality industry because you know what are they going to do with this like what it says people should enjoy themselves but be cautious when celebrating the new year so that you get care minister Gillian Keegan Revelers should take a lateral flow test before going out and celebrating the well-ventilated areas. But the irony is, especially in the UK, last time I checked, I'm not sure if it's changed now, but lateral flow tests were sold out, right? These tests are hard to get a hold of, especially if you want them free from the government. Maybe if you pay for them, I'm sure they'll be a lot more easier to get a hold of. But these free tests they're sending out to everybody are few and far between. I've heard rumours as to do with the strikes. I've heard rumours that the government are kind of purposely doing it so that it can encourage people to go get boosted. Um, I'm not too sure, but either way, getting a hold of the lateral flow test nowadays is really difficult. So, you know, it just makes it hard to do the right thing. They continue to say the government is not imposing further COVID restrictions in England, but these limits on socialising, but there are limits in socialising in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. England had reported a high of 100 and what? 100 and... 117,000 cases while figures from Wales indicate a steep rise before Christmas. Uh, provisional data in Scotland suggests that 9,360 people have tested positive down to its record 11,000 on December 26. No case data is available for Northern Ireland due to Christmas holidays. Meanwhile, England saw 1,374 COVID hospital admissions on 26th of December, the highest since February. The total of 9,546 5, 9, people in hospital with COVID in England. Official figures show this is the highest since March, but well below the peak of 34,000 in January. Oh, that January was tense, isn't it? And again, man, the, the mental t anguish that this causes, it's just like something has to be said in terms of, I don't, I don't even know if all these lockdowns are worth it in terms of the long lasting mental effects this is going to have on people. I honestly don't know, especially when you have to kind of weigh up between like the people that are dying and the people that are having kind of long COVID effects. And again, long COVID effects, I guess, would include mental health and shit, but the kids and the people without jobs and whatnot, I just can't imagine what it's like, to, what, it's, what it kind of feels like to go through that rigmarole. You're applying for jobs, you're feeling like you're not going anywhere, then the world reopens up again, gives you a bit of hope because that means industry, if the, if the world reopens that means certain sectors reopen that means maybe um demand is high that means maybe sales are high that means maybe you might get a job soon then suddenly they change the things again things lock down again people stop hiring and then you're back to square one same with kids in school like first of all you're in class then you're then you're in um uh limited occupancy classes with like you know reduced people so you have to split the rooms and you have to come in at a certain time like staggered then you're working from then you're learning from home with like on the laptop and stuff like horrible 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 and it continues says not all patients in hospital will uh, have been admitted for covid latest data just that um about three in ten have viruses but were admitted to hospital for something else which is also always an, a nonsense isn't it why do they make these numbers so high if they're not too sure if everybody that's in those numbers has covid it's such a weird way to report data this also again like i said this kind of um this kind of weird fudging of the numbers if you or i don't know this intentional unintentional misreporting of the numbers i feel like if anything this galvanizes people that are conspiracy theories or people that are like anti-vaxxers because if they can lie about this sort of stuff then in their heads they can lie about everything when maybe it's not a lie maybe it's just the way they report the numbers it just is what it is i don't know too sure but why won't you just report the numbers accurately and just say this is the amount of people that are in hospital because they were suffering from some form of covid right and these are the people who maybe got to hospital and maybe got covid when they got here but let's not group them all in at once because that just doesn't it's not accurate that number it's just not accurate if you're saying one in three um only have the virus 
It says here, Miss Keegan said that while people should try to enjoy themselves on a new year, Omicron was highly infectious and they needed extra exercise. To, they needed to exercise, sorry, exercise caution. The hospitality sector said the decision not to add further measures was a lifeline for pubs, bars and clubs, but of course a lifeline and also a double-edged sword. Miss um, Keegan also said that 214,000 people had received their booster jab over the Christmas weekend and a total of 32.4 million had received their third dose. Yeah, true. I've, um, I also got, I think they sent out a mass text to everybody here in the UK to get boosted and stuff. I said already, I'm not getting boosted. I've done my job. I did my double jab already, you know, enough with it boosted. Unless, of course, the boosted um, jab requires, in, unless my requirement to go and travel places means i have to get boosted i'm not going to get it i just i refuse it's just too much of this stuff man it just doesn't it never ends next by by next summer or by next winter there'll be another jab you have to get another pill another this just enough enough is enough i've been double jabbed already i've got my vaccine passport i'm having to show that to get into places which is already you know um something that goes against everything i stand for but i'm doing it because i just want to live a somewhat normal life and now you ask me to get jabbed i'm just it boosted a story i'm just enough is enough and also the boost does it guarantee i don't get a virus no does it increase my chances of not getting it cool but if it doesn't guarantee either way i'm not getting it i'm just i just not especially at this point in time i just refuse um but yeah let's move off of that because covid talk is fucking boring um let's talk about this this is a clip courtesy of fashion demics on um twitter um he posted this clip which is an excerpt of tyler the creator speaking to fast company about his golf le fleur brand or his golf le fleur yeah brand you'd say right or project that he's currently pursuing and obviously the launch of his fragrance he did a cool little pop-up shop on some um, hollywood hill mountain top place looked amazing um he had these vintage rolls royce there invited all his cool friends you know m notable names like jay-z andre 3000 and a few other people were there in attendance and it just seemed to be in my opinion the perfect combination of what he's been trying to do as a creative as an artist um as just a person living in the world at the moment everything he's kind of been doing from the moment he kind of burst onto the scene to now has basically led to this moment and i think it's a perfect representation of where he's at and i think it's a perfect platform for him to kind of do bigger and better things maybe apart from what he was doing previously with the, the other brands and other iteration projects he had going forward it's probably the most mature version of tyler's vision we've seen so far maybe the most palatable to the general consumer even though i still think it stands out really a lot from the things that you see out there from the color palette to the to the font to the materials um you know to the shapes of some of the stuff that he, he makes and he designs it's really it's really de defined you can't really find another brand out there that makes similar items maybe they might make similar items but i don't think they kind of um eschewed a similar sort of aesthetic they don't at all and even these lookbooks they're completely different to anybody else right i don't think anybody else saturates their pictures as much as tyler the creator does on his kind of lookbook pictures maybe the saturation maybe it's the film they use but whatever it's all really well done the models are always great great casting great photography um, everything just looks amazing and again he spoke a little bit about the launch of it and the bittersweet moment he had when he launched it because it also coincided with um, Virgil Abloh's untimely passing obviously um, it's been a month now supposedly I read online which is absolutely crazy man considering how monumental and kind of mind altering that kind of news was when it came on the timeline especially for me having you know having worked with him in a small capacity in the past it's something that really i'm I, i've still kind of struggled to kind of reconcile especially considering how big how large the life of a personality is and his influence and all that i'm lucky you know i've already spoken about it on a podcast but i thought tyler really spoke about it really well and again I think there's a lesson to be learned from this or a lesson to be gathered um from this clip and hopefully other kids coming up um kind of heed kind of listen to all these stories about Virgil and how he conducted himself and they also kind of play it forward with the people that they speak to or the people they come in communication with and we kind of get rid of this kind of cooler than sort of attitude that exists within this scene of ours right streetwear fashion whatever it is there is this kind of like oh I'm not gonna give you props or I'm not gonna shout you out or I'm not gonna give you the keys or I'm not gonna open the door for you I'm gonna keep you know I mean all this kind of weird sort of um hoarding of resources and connections that exist in this world which i understand why exist because like i've always said i've you know having worked in brands like nike and adidas in the corporate offices and stuff and tried to again i tried to maneuver in that world and i failed you know dramatically because of course um my personality just doesn't match up well with the people that work there i just wasn't able or willing to do the things needed in order to kind of get forward in life in that situation but um 
we know why that actually exists. <coughs> Sorry. And the reason why it exists in there is because usually the people that are working in these roles that you want, you know, whether it's a energy marketing director, whatever it may be, they're usually no smarter than you or I. They're usually people just that look like you and I. And usually if you get that role, I wouldn't say you got it by chance, but you didn't only get it because you were the best person they could have hired. You were the one that got it at that time because you just got it at that time. There's many people that could have got done that job easily with their eyes closed. So I think once you get that, there is that realization and if anything, you want to just protect your position. So you don't want to get people in next to you that are better than you or that have potential, whatever, because you're afraid it's going to diminish your influence. And this might, make, this might make people question, why hire you if I could just hire the young kid that knows way more than you, I can pay him less, right? There's that kind of idea that wrangles. But what Virgil did, which was very rare, was that he had a very high position. He had he probably ascended the levels of clout higher than anybody else could have ascended to, especially when it, especially when you think about how many people he was friends with because he didn't really have beef with anybody. He had friends with fucking everybody, right? Um, so with that being the case, he was the rare one who who at the the higher he got up, the more he started to basically bring other people in which is really bizarre from the people that recorded these shows behind the scenes to the stylists, to the people that helped out with designs. He seemed to give people more opportunities, the more successful he became. And I think this is even before he maybe got diagnosed with what he got diagnosed with. I'm pretty sure it's just how he is as a person. So I think that's one of his last legacies. And I hope the kids coming up can do away with the old way of doing things that I grew up in which was basically just let's hold it all together let's only bring in my friends nepotism stuff um hoarding of resources just being plain rude and being a bit of a bad mind or bad influence in that regard and just be open to kind of giving everybody the keys and everybody the opportunity to kind of win as well because if we want to change things if we want to build a better future for us and our kids and our further generations I think the way we do it is by just coming coming bringing love into the situation love support um, compa all that stuff you know what I mean right I think that's the best way to go about things but anyway let's play the clip of Tyler talking about it because me rambling is pointless you want to hear Tyler and here's Tyler talking about how Virgil helped him start golf Le Fleur courtesy of Fashion Demics oh one second I don't think it's playing Oops, let me just go back there. I don't think I got the settings working on there. Let me just quickly move it. Properties, I think I didn't mess up. There you go. Uh, do, 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 there we go. SWB. Got the wrong one there. I think it should be working now. Bear with me one second. Let's rewind back. And let's play, see if that plays. It was when I like decided like, oh dude, I think I'm gonna do this the floor thing. And what who who really pushed me to do it was my boy Dev Hines, Solange, and Virgil. And I was like, yo, man, I think I want to do this thing. Like, just make really nice stuff. It's a separate world. I don't know exactly, exactly what it is, but I know I want to make pants like this and pieces like this and trunks and just cool shit like Something this. Something different than what you've been Something doing for, what for I've a been long doing. time. Yeah. He's like, oh, I, what, what do you need? I'm like, well, I don't even know where to... Here. Give me a week. Bro, he put me in contact with people in Italy and here and there, emails on calls, like face FaceTimes with people I don't know, introducing me. All, like, and this was the week that I was going to say, hey, Virgil, what you helped me with, what you got me started with, what your helping hand did, I finally get to show you what you did. Like, and I was like, I wanted him here so bad to see like, hey, look what I did. Cause I wanted him to just say fire. And I wanted him to be like, no, like, and I always go out of my way to whoever helped me or spy, I always go out of my way to say like, no, you don't understand. Thank you. And it was this week where I was going to finally get send that invite and say, hey, the day, the next day I was going to send an invite like, hey, I'm doing something this week. Come see. Because he helped me get this here. This material, this material, this sweater is because of him. And I'm just like, ah, oh, all this shit is, I'm just like, dude, fuck. But now I just got to go super duper. He was about ideas and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like now. 
yeah man he's right he's right and i guess that's the only kind of hope i guess you know that that's the only silver lining i think for the untimely passing of virgil because i said i think a lot of us are still processing it and still coming to grips with it especially considering a lot of people you know maybe felt that they didn't maybe give him the props or his flowers that he deserved at the time that he was alive. But I think a great way to honor somebody like that um, will be to just follow in their footsteps, isn't it? Will just be to do what they did for others, to up, what, so what they did for other people, you should also do for people in your life. And whether it's kind of bigging up people and giving them their props when needed to be, I've done it a few times. I've sent people some DMs and be like, hey, you've been important to my progression and the things I've wanted to do. And just, you know, without any expectation or, you know, entitlement, just be like, hey, I just want to let you know what you did here was important and maybe specify a moment and just leave it there just so they're aware so if somebody outside of their kind of remit i've done that whether it's you're in a position to kind of give somebody some keys or some gems or some secrets or open some doors for them do that as well because like i said like virgil ascended the levels of clout ascended levels of fame and success again he wasn't very materialistic in terms of sharing his wealth and whatnot but listen there's no denying the guy was a multi-millionaire from you know psd files and you know fucking around on photoshop and whatnot right That's that's what he was a millionaire from doing the thing that all we all want to want to do right living what you could have what aaron bondarov said back in the day uh, turning his lifestyle into a job he basically did it right he re reached the uh, the zenith of that even though most people probably didn't think he maybe quote unquote deserve it but he did it and when he got to that level instead of just closing the doors and only leaving it to his friends he extended his arm back and pulled through so many different people who essentially have a career in fashion now basically because of him or that little bit of rub a little bit of shine and he did it again without in without expectation without kind of thinking oh i'm gonna do this and you're gonna be my guy forever no just because he went to be a good dude and because he knew also the more you surround yourself with amazing people and you have all these different people who can say hey they can point to you as to being the person that kind of helped them the more it makes you look better and the more it kind of if you if you notice too i realized it a lot of people would have some very critical things to say about his designs or to say about the things he put out there but for the most part people were very conscious to not go overboard when it come to getting at him as a person because there was no way you could because all the evidence pointed out so far again apart from maybe a couple of missteps here and there all the evidence so far pointed that he's a great dude so you, even though you might not like the designs you can't go super overboard with the criticism because he's a great dude he seems to do by he seems to do really he seems to do good by his friends all the time and even if you don't know him he still seems to do good by his friends right there's people sharing dms of him which again i'm not a fan of but there's people sharing dms of him who didn't hardly even know the guy he just sent him a random dm showed him a design and he quickly fired back some critique and some help and you don't know how far that could have helped somebody in terms of where they're going so hopefully that's the lasting legacy and influence that he kind of leaves and people People basically take that on and pay it forward in their own way and we don't regress back to where we were previously like i said like how i grew up in my generation where you know it made me i can even say i'm, I'm even you know honest enough to admit it made me be a little bit um bitter it made me be a little bit um disillusioned with the scene and overall which is why i completely stepped back and basically ran away and did my own thing and removed all communication with most of those people that i kind of grew up with who who basically you know maybe quote unquote showed me the way but the attitudes and the entitlement and the lack of bringing in all this again no one's asking you to do anything for anybody but still there was a lack of that kind of whatever Virgil had that didn't exist back then and I think he, ironically enough the people he had closest to him were the ones who were kind of you know the the ones who basically caused a lot of the issues that we have in our scene in terms of the attitudes and why they weren't going on but again I'm hoping his passing wasn't for nothing and uh, you know everything happens in life for a reason and if the passing of Virgil spawns you know 10,000 other Virgils in their own little scene in their own place in the country in their own place in the world that will be an amazing legacy to leave right that you basically left the legacy where people were more kind and more open and more willing to work with people and open doors and stuff that's an amazing legacy to leave forget forget a hoodie forget a tracksuit pants forget some nike collaborations if you can change people's mindsets and how they communicate with their fellow man and their fellow brothers and sisters out there that's fucking incredible i think so again big up tyler great words and again check out the entire interview on fast company really really good interview um it's again it's a great if you're a fan of tyler the creator interviews this is one of the better ones because at this point of his life like i said i think he's the best version of himself so if you want to gain a bit more understanding of where he's trying to go to and what led up to this moment definitely check that out definitely definitely check that out then moving on we wanted to talk about another update concerning street type stuff or fashion type stuff and again it just it does it, 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 
it, it kind of it gets worse before it gets better for Travis Scott in it. It really does, man. Um, this is courtesy of TMZ. It says here the news that we all kind of knew would be the case. I don't think anybody, even his strongest fans, really thought this was not going to happen. But it says here dual partnership put on hold in wake of Asher were tra tragedy. So I think what was it? What show was it? Did it mention it in the thing? But anyway, there was a deal. Yeah, this is it for the dual twenty twenty collection. Um, Travis Scott had a capsule kind of whatever thing tied in with Dior obviously Kim Jones is a big fan of hip-hop and obviously tied him in and brought him into the, the Dior project and it looked pretty decent from what I saw again I'm not a fan of it probably not going to purchase any of it but in terms of you know the synergy in terms of brands and him being friends and him being brand friendly at that time it made complete sense but obviously in the wake of the Asher World tragedy um, where all those kids died at his festival it just didn't make any sense for them to drop it. It just didn't make any sense whatsoever. It's kind of similar to what happened to Virgil, actually, RIP, when he went through that nonsense with the whole, like, donation money. And I think he had to do with the Michael Jackson collaboration, right? And they kind of backed away from that because of all the backlash that happened with that. So it's just a, it's a kind of standard protocol that happens when you are a big brand and you're dealing with some level of backlash online. You probably want to mitigate the amount of bad press you get by just avoiding bad press. So the best way to do it is obviously to kind of get rid of those kind of collaborations that might be a bit tense might be a bit um, controversial or whatnot the Travis Scott thing though the difference here is that this just puts a worse light on him as a person when it comes to the up and coming trials or cases whatever it's going to be concerning the deaths at Asher world and it makes it seem like they're going to go after him super hard like this is what it's looking like it's not looking like they're going to say it's not your fault and it's the organize it's the kind of companies that you hire to put a festival together or whatever it may be it looks like they're going to obviously go after those people whether it's Rock Nation, or I don't know, whoever he's signed to, whether it's Live Nation, sorry, um, whoever whoever else is involved, they're obviously going to go for them, but there's also going to be some level of consequences being put at the feet of Travis Scott, which, again, I'm not too sure how I feel about that stuff. I think in general, in hindsight, all that stuff looks bad with him continuing to do the show and stuff, but I don't know, man. I don't know how much you can directly say he was to blame for the deaths, um, obviously, at the festival, but I guess the only thing I would say about that is, especially if you're a fan, you have to realize if that festival was a success and everyone left there saying that was one of the best festivals ever and they should do more of these Astro World festivals around the world and sponsors were falling over themselves to, you know, align themselves with that festival, then Travis would also get all the praise. No one would be mentioning Live Nation. No one would be mentioning whoever else helps out do the thing. No one would mention him. All the praise would fall at Travis Scott's feet. So if that's the case, if you have to, if you would accept all the praise if it went well, you also have to accept all the blame if it goes bad. That's really what real leadership is like, isn't it? Or what real, real leadership is about. You have to accept the, the good and the bad. And I guess, again, maybe because of the case, but I guess this unwillingness to accept blame so far is not looking good. And then also all these brands that he's, linked with prior because of how brand friendly he was ditching him at the first point of and again it's, it's not like they're this will be different if they ditched him when once the investigation started to ramp up and once the court date was announced and stuff that'll make more sense but they're ditching him now and they have we haven't even got many details on what the court cases are like of course we have we've heard that big number about i think it's a billion or something people are talking about about the a billion is it a billion or something the, the court case or, or something there's, there's some there's some number out there that exists where the parents are going to really sue really really high right in terms of the money in terms of compensation but we haven't really heard anything else apart from that it's just been you know whatever we heard so far in the press so the fact that these brands these organizations are deciding to sever their sever their connection with him so far that's not good. The only saving grace with this would be in the headline is that it's on hold. It's not been completely axed or cancelled. So maybe there's some room for manoeuvre there. But let's read the article itself. It says Travis Scott's Catus Jack Clabber with Dior has been put on ice. Dior made it clear on Tuesday the project between Travis and the Dior men's artistic director, Kim Jones, Hawking Travis Scott's Jack line. So have Travis Scott's Catus Jack line would not be released in the foreseeable future and possibly never. Dior said um, our respect for everyone affected by the tragic events at Astrowood, um, Dior has decided to postpone indefinitely the launch of the products from the Cactus Jack collaboration um, that to, to be included in this summer 2022 collection. Um, sources connected with the Scott tell TMZ this was a mutual decision made by both Dior and Travis Scott. I don't believe that because so far, evidence we've seen so far, Travis Scott wants to perform. He wants to be out and about. He wants to do his thing. He doesn't really think he did anything wrong. So to suggest that he was the one that sat down and said, yeah, Dior should chill out with the deal. I don't think so. Especially come off the back of his um, um, 
drink thing deal being spun, being cancelled too. I don't think that's true. Sources connected with Travis Scott tell TMZ this was a mutual decision um, and to postpone the upcoming collection due to due in June 2022 with both parties working to reschedule the launch at a later date. There has been other projects and engagements that have been sidelined in the wake of the National World Tragedy. Among the projects are Nike, which is set to launch an Air Max One sneaker with Scott early this month. So you got Nike, you got the drink, you got this, you got Coachella. Crazy. As of as you know, ten people died during the first night of the festival, and more than three hundred people were injured. Scott continued performing for more than 40 minutes after the f fire officials declared a mass casualty event. Scott says he had no idea of the calamity below and apparently neither did the cops who seemed oblivious to the deaths and the injured in the crowd. Had Dior gone through with the partnership, it would have been the first time the company collabed with a musician and it would have been the first time Dior allowed alternation, alteration sorry, of its logo. So it would have been a big deal, right? It's a big deal. Let's not get that twisted that this thing is getting cancelled, this thing is not going to be on. But... It just makes sense, man. I, like, I don't think with, with good faith you can go and do this, especially in the wake of everything going on. The last thing this guy needs to be thinking about is fucking Dior Jordan 1s and shit. You should be focusing on, you know, trying to build a good case for yourself, especially if you want to defend yourself and you think you really did nothing wrong. You need to focus on that. If it's a case of redemption, you need to basically look like you're somewhat remorseful. And I don't think, again, gallivanting around doing press for a Dior collection is a good idea. Um, for the brand Dior, it's not good. Again, why, why, if you're Dior, why would you want to be aligned with this mess for free? If you can step away, why do it? Because again, they had nothing to do with the Asher World tragedy, but why would you intentionally get yourself involved in this and kind of just, you know, attract all this negative press when you don't have to, especially now considering the pandemic, considering everyone's sales are down anyway. <coughs> you want to maximize your ability to sell garments and to shift product. And there's no, you know, worse away than doing it than kind of lining yourself with somebody at the moment who happens to be a bit of a social pariah. But like I said before, it's not a good sign for Travis if you're a fan of his because it looks like they're coming after him personally. Maybe redemption art. <coughs> Sorry. Maybe redemption. The good thing I could see, maybe the fact that it's on hold. So it's one thing that hasn't been indefinitely forever cancelled. But again, considering they're doing it so early, um, without no real details of what's going on in the court case and if he is to blame blah 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 this doesn't really speak well for the future of him and his career going forward man it really doesn't because i'm just trying to picture a scenario where he's back on stage doing what he does best he's out releasing music he's on twitter you know raging and t t saying stuff and i just i, I don't know I, I i can't really picture it in my head it just seems a bit far-fetched at the moment but you know maybe that is what it is da -da -da -da. And then um, lastly, I think we can talk about this one. This is a topic courtesy of Vulture. It's an interesting topic to talk about because I just want to kind of um, gauge people's impression about these sort of things, right? So this is an uh, article of courtesy of Vulture and it's covering a podcast I listen to quite often called How Long Gone? I think that comes out three times a week, um, hosted by Chris Black and Jason Stewart, um, also known as uh, Done to Death and um, Dem Jeans on social media. So I guess if you're around the whole like menswear, streetwear, culture, hype beast, whatever industry scene thing, you might have seen them around being shared and retweeted. Um, and the podcast kind of came out of nowhere for me. I didn't really know they were doing one together. Um, I had followed Chris Black on Twitter on and off here and there because his personality is quite annoying to basically follow online. He's kind of those kind of eternally pessimistic contrarian types that's always trying to put out hot takes and go against the grain of what people like and don't like it just gets annoying after a while you know when someone consistently just keeps putting out hot take after hot take after hot take i was like you know what? i'm gonna stop so i just unfollowed him in general but then you know now that i've got a lot more people on my social that i follow up to a thousand i think i'm following more than a thousand maybe it I, I don't basically see his tweets too often so i think that's why basically made it good but the podcast itself i think is a good it's a better way to enjoy him as a person because i think he him and um jason's relationship is really cool so they bounce off each other really well so even though chris black as a person himself is a pretty um uh, he can turn you off a bit, right? His personality, he can, he's can he's not the most likable guy in the world. I think he can even admit that himself. But I think because Jason is so likable, it kind of, they rub off each other well, rub off, you know, you know what I mean, right? They kind of bounce off each other really well. And the podcast has done really good over the short space of time it's been around. But it's also been weird to see all these placed um, editorial 
write-ups being put in places, right? I don't know if they're paying for them. I don't know if they've got a really good publicist, but it's a very um, interesting approach to market a podcast where it's obviously m mostly guest-led, even though I think the individual ones are really good. I have to be honest. I think I kind of enjoy the, the ones where they're just doing it themselves without guests than I do with the guests because the guests, it really depends if they've got a vibe and because they're always doing it over Zoom or Skype or whatnot, to have that kind of banter that they obviously have between each other, Jason Stewart and, and sorry, and um, Chris Black, they have a very um, particular kind of banter between the both of them. If the other person doesn't necessarily vibe, it doesn't work. Like a good one I think of is that girl from Japanese Breakfast or that girl that uses the Monarchy of Japanese Breakfast. She was a bit of a bitch when she went on the show. Again, not her fault, but you know, she didn't vibe with the guys, but it just didn't work because they weren't in front of each other. She just didn't like their personality and their interests and they, it just made for a shit podcast. But when they're on their own, they're pretty good. But there's no denying that it's very guest led and there's no denying they were very strategic in terms of getting big guests, but also getting guests with maybe followings online, guests that maybe would immediately kind of um, generate some sort of write-up in these kind of publications. But it's very weird to see so many write-ups about a podcast that not a lot of people listen to. Again, in, in, that, in kind of the overall sense of the things. Again, my podcast isn't necessarily anything to write home about, but let's just talk about it in general. It's very interesting to see so many write-ups on these kind of publications about podcasts hardly, hardly anyone listens to that's also very guest-led just feels a bit odd do you know what I mean it just feels a very very odd um but I guess you know maybe these places don't really have many things to write about and this is a good way to kind of cover culture and what's going on especially during the pandemic times because it feels like this podcast came about during the pandemic because I guess they had they couldn't do whatever they did normally so why not start this new project and see where it goes and now it's turned into this whole business they're signed to a label they're doing live shows so this is fucking smashing it the merch is great but it just feels a little bit it feels a little bit payolery that's it. it just feels a little bit payolery like it just feels a little bit like are these guys your friends that writing these things are you paying for them why are you keep getting like it's just it feels a bit too forced and I, I don't know whatever things are forced down your throat or especially my throat i tend to gag first of all and also i tend to question why somebody's forcing something down my throat like is the reality better than what they're presenting i don't really know i'm not too sure but let's just quickly read over the article Currently, the vulture says, "Why are all your cool friends listening to How Long Gone, Chris Black, and Jason Stewart on their Broy Culture podcast? Unexpected appeal." It says, "On a crisp October evening, um, the line to get into the Bowery Ballroom was long enough to wrap around the block. It was filled with lower Manhattan and Brooklyn types, hoodies, denim jeans, good jackets, demographic, lots of men, <laughs> mostly white." <laughs> yeah i wonder if there's many black people listen to this got podcast i might be one of the few especially a black english dude um but anyway continue um lots of men mostly white mostly working in media or advertising or fashion or something adjacent yeah i don't work in any of those fields so it's cool um a few spots uh down for me two guys were talking podcast networks and spotify deals between pause from a vape pen so yeah you have to be very this is a true this is a very for the heads podcast it's not for a casual listener you have to be very innocent but to be honest too I enjoy these guys way more than the who's the other guys um falling is it failing upwards falling upwards right falling upwards I think I don't get that humor I think that they're, they're a little bit too um uh cartoonish for me right in that regard that's what I mean or maybe because I'm I'm similar in age to the, or no, no they're way older than me isn't it Chris but yeah but I don't know whatever it is I prefer the, how long gone to like the, the the falling upwards or the failing upwards whatever it's called um anyway it continues Playing the ballroom that night, a storied venue usually reserved for indie bands and the likes of Patti Smith was How Long Gone, the so-called by Coastal Elite podcast hosted by Chris Black and Jason Stewart. Um, the tour would include 11 cities, but the Nashville show and a few nights had been scrapped owing to low ticket sales. Tonight's gig, however, was sold out. By the time the curtains lifted, the room was packed slightly, tightly, so barely a wiggle room to be found in the crowd. A bit of a par there, including the lack of ticket sales, but we move. The show was a bit of a mess, however. Ew. Against a backdrop, a background sports correspondent credit for anchor the spotify division that frequently advertised on the show black and stewart kicked off the night festivities with what amounted to a short somewhat a bit obvious set raging on the cities that they had just played stewart went for an alec baldwin joke just a few days after the rust shooting incident it landed like a fud the interview segments were all over the place stilted and awkward in equal measure even if the nice guests were intriguing, interview magazine editor in chief Mel Ottenberg, comedian Lauren Cerevidio, anonymous downtown personalities and podcasters I unpack, Alison Roman, an early guest of the podcast, was supposed to appear at the night but ultimately wasn't able to make it. Roman decided she had to go upstate or something, said Black on stage. I'm assuming she was uh, making kimchi out of ramps, some important business thing, said Stuart. 
But to be honest to this article, to be fair to them though, live podcast has never been a vibe for me. I never understand people that go to them. Maybe to go, maybe understand the appeal to go to a live podcast if you want to just have a sense of community because I guess it might be quite fun to go and meet people who are also into this you know niche podcast that you listen to every three times a week or maybe if you want to go and actually buy merch in hand because i know sometimes these podcast networks or these podcast shows in general they take ages to ship shit so if you want to actually buy stuff in hand and actually go back home with it maybe it's a good way to kind of you know uh, bump this line in that way but i never thought the idea of going to a live show where somebody just sits on the stage and speaks the way i'm speaking was any fun especially if it's not done in a very structured way i'm sure there's ways to make it work but it have to be very not interactive but it have to be done like a product like a show like you actually putting on an actual like broadway show an actual performance right where you have segments and you have things rehearsed and bloody blah and cue points that might be a way to do it but again that also requires a lot of effort and maybe a lot of money a lot of time blah 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 and i assume most of these places the hiring fee is already a lot so is the equipment fee and all that stuff and if you're a podcast you just want to get on there and do what you do because you think if people are buying tickets they're buying tickets under the guise that we're just going to do what we do on the podcast anyway so why go the extra step do you understand but it sounds tough it says here for the most part the crowd that might seem to enjoy just being there though it did not occur to me that sorry though, though it did occur to me that given the podcast clicky appeal many of the 500 or so people in the room were probably connected to the host at least to some degree it was tricky seem to pass <laughs> so what they're saying they're saying that they sold all their tickets to their friends you know this article isn't the most glowing anyway to be fair um, how long in general uh, sorry how long gone in general can be a tricky phenomenon to wrap around your head over the past year the show said it's had quietly um, but clearly become a favorite podcast among what normies like myself might like to call the cultural insiders those in the know or more simply the quote unquote cool people fans include the playwright jeremy o harris the new york times pop music critic john carmichael and the call your friend sorry and call your girlfriend co-host um amini tau stowe though it should be noted that two of these individuals have been guests on the show before the two podcasts have broken the podcast has broken into a regular listening rotation as well though i'm still trying to figure out why it says i quote to me it's extremely inside baseball micro scene report says carmichael so it says cara mancy Kara Manisi. How do you say that name? Karaman Karamanika. Karamanika? <laughs> um, an early guest on the show said when I asked him about his apparent resonance um, with the culturally hip a lot of what Chris and Jason are doing is skipping the text for the meta text there's a lot of unspoken foundational knowledge since its launch and as pandemic project in March 2020 how long gone has endured several rounds of buzz this included a glowing profile in Vogue again all these profiles is it payola is it real who knows um last november another one in new york times shortly before the start of the tour the announcement of the tour made the rolling stones and it came packaged with another mark of prestige in what appears to be the first podcast to be signed with, with a deal with a jag jaguar a vaunted indie rock label that reps the likes of bon Iver and angel olsen um the deal involves the production of a peculiar artifact, How Long God Adds Color, a double CD containing a curated list of 11 songs at the Cross Dragon Dragon's universe with an interst so with an interst interstitial how do you say that right commentary provided by black and stewart sample color i didn't realize sharon von vetten von sorry sharon van eaton was in the twin peaks reboot did you catch that i barely caught that in the first twin peaks tough to follow even the drugs the set comes out this week oh that's tough um the uninitiated 24 uninitiated how long gone can be a hard sell it's partly uh due to the substance being hard to pin down but mostly to do with the host being exaggerating exasperating to its observers including many of the colleagues for example these reactions are reasonable i don't deny it to begin with any description of how long gone probably has led to how the podcast hosted by two straight white dudes who use the platform to deem whatever things are in culture a culture that is rapidly shifting away from and actively negotiating this relationship with straight white dudes to meet their standards of cool and uncool ah you can fuck off all that shit it's a cool podcast the guys are cool one the one of the hosts is really annoying and kind of you know a bit of a turn off but you can't stop listening to him and the other one's really funny so when you get them both in a room it works it just is what it is isn't it um and they obviously have interesting guests on that people want to listen to they had lena dunham on recently i skipped that completely because you know she seems like a bit of a nightmare to listen to in general and all that stuff she did with odell beckham kind of turned me off as a person again great artist but i'm not listening to her talk can't do that but in general the guests are pretty decent i listened to alice and roman episode recently today and i thought that was enjoyable um 
it says here you could barely you can barely see the problem here um actually listening to an episode can be a gamble too the two men are prone to discuss music fashion parties and brands expensive restaurants and luxury goods in a particular order but with a very particular kind of confidence whether expressing disdain for the fandom around the succession or extolling the virtues of flying delta one they seem motivated by a strong belief that corners remains a thing that tangibly exists can be attained and desirable all this results in a specific aggressively tribal vibe um describable as a shock jock light or generally in the direction of being an arsehole depending on your taste yeah that's a fair uh, description of it i think being cool is fairly desirable still i don't think there is such a thing as being uncool as being cool i think people that even are trying to be uncool are still cool in their own way so this whole idea that there is no good and bad things in culture there is no such thing as good and bad art good and bad restaurants good and bad parties is absolutely nonsensical we've all been to shit parties we know what they are we don't repeat those experiences we've all eaten a bad meal especially at places where you've been told it's the greatest place on earth and then you go and it's a complete letdown you don't want that to repeat again because it's a waste of money waste of time and it fucking annoys you so if somebody wants to point you the right direction via a podcast and let you know hey go there don't go here that's a pretty much a good thing you know they're doing a good service and also they may be refining your taste palette and the way that you view things um i don't think that's a bad thing this this whole um this whole acceptance of mediocrity we have in culture now at the moment is horrendous man <clears throat> But yeah, it's a long article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a bit longer than that, but just wanted to point out that regard. Again, if you're list struggling to something to listen to, especially if you like the kind of stuff that I talk about, definitely check out How Long Gone. Um, available wherever you get podcasts. Available wherever you get podcasts. And that's a wrap. Ladies and gentlemen, single show episode number 532. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your time. If it's your first time taking a show via YouTube, like, subscribe, you know, that stuff. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review. If you're listening via the podcast, you'll hear a song as a natural. If you're watching via YouTube, you won't hear anything. It'll just end abruptly as per usual. But apart from that, it's been fun to have you guys around. Of course, support the Patreon, please, at patreon.com for Agostino. I'll have a bonus episode happening at the end of the week. I've got a mix already out at the moment. DJ Handsome Blackman Mix, text mix, episode number 59. I'm also launching a new channel with all my DJ specific things on there. So watch out for that and subscribe on that one too. But apart from that, take care, be safe. Great to have you guys again. And I'll see you guys very soon. Peace.